Hey everyone, welcome to AgriLife's What's Growing On. This episode, we're gonna talk about apples. So Tim, apples are one of those fruit that are incredibly popular. And if you were to ask people if you could have one fruit tree in your yard, they're probably gonna say something like peaches, and then there's gonna be some group that say apples. We don't see many apples in Texas. Why is that? Well, apples uh, generally are, are generally not considered to be that well adapted to Texas. And the main reason is because most of the varieties that we're familiar with, especially like Honeycrisp and, and Red Delicious, tend to have higher requirements for winter chilling than what we typically get in Texas. The other thing is that many of the apple varieties are also very susceptible to disease issues. So what you're saying is growing apples is kind of hard. It can be, but of course there are different varieties too. So we're here in College Station, but we're in the humid Gulf Coast and we're standing here in a row of apple trees. And so in this row, we've got about a dozen different varieties here. And we're gonna tell you about how to grow apples in your backyard and how to avoid some of those pitfalls. And really, if you wanna be successful with apples or frankly, any fruit, you have to start off on the right foot. So Tim, if you were gonna plant an apple tree or a peach tree or a pear, what kind of recommendations would you have when should you actually start looking for your plants? Should you wait until spring and you have spring fever and you're ready to go garden, or should you be doing it now? Well, spring might be a good time to be thinking about doing your research and figuring out what varieties you actually want. But uh, when, we, when we're talking about planting, we want to plant and, and purchase our trees as early as possible. So the best time to plant actually is in the fall. If we can get those trees in the fall, October, November, especially if they're containerized, grown in pots, if they vary, we may have to wait a little bit longer because we really depend on when the nurseries are able to dig. But the earlier, the better. Okay, so it's the end of August now, and you can actually start ordering from a lot of the nurseries uh, in the fall. So now, September, October, and many times if you're talking bare root, that's going to be for a spring delivery. And if you wait until spring, a lot of times they're out of stock, and you may not be able to get what you want. <laughs> a little bit about how to get your site ready to plant. So if you're getting ready to grow apples, pears, peaches, there's a couple of things you need to think about before you get started. First is your soil. So you should have your soil tested really if you're going to grow anything um, that has any value or you're going to spend any money or time or effort because soil test is going to tell you what your soil conditions are and your potential for success and the potential need to make adjustments or amendments. Yeah, it's going to take that guesswork out of out of what you need in terms of making fertilizer applications because it's going to tell you specifically in your location, your even your area of the backyard, uh, what conditions are present, what you need, what you don't need, um, and of course soil can really vary just just in a matter of a hundred yards from one site to another. What about soil types? So, in this in this case. The soil we have here uh, is pretty sandy, but most of College Station is, is heavy clay. We're not blessed with good soil, so what do you think? What, what can we do to improve our chances of success for apples or any other? So, of course, when you look at most plants, most horticultural plants, especially fruit trees, it always says well-drained soil. So we're talking about, like uh, Dr. Shiner said, sandy type soil, sandy loam, loam type texture however a lot of times we don't have that and the other thing you want to look at is the depth of that soil soil changes as you go down in the profile and so here in college station we have oftentimes a thin layer of sandy top soil but then it's this really heavy clay which does not drain very well and of course the issues with uh, poorly drained clay soil especially when that that clay is poorly structured is that water hangs around for too long um, and we end up with root rot or vigor and just a lot of a lot of other problems. So some of the things we can do, uh, we can build a raised bed. We can do that uh, with uh, things like landscape timbers, treated lumber. We can actually build essentially a flower bed. Um, and for a fruit tree, we want to have this to be at least about six feet wide or so and about a foot high, ideally. Or what we can do on a larger scale is we can burn. Um, and so essentially we've got like a terrace it's higher in the middle and uh, crown in the middle, it gently slopes down. By elevating the soil, the 
trees are going to be growing in, that's going to allow gravity to pull out that excess water for us. So on our site here, what we did is burn slightly, especially where the tree is planted. So we have the tree raised by about a foot or so, and that's because this is a low spot in the yard. The soil drains well, but the water tends to pool in this area because it's a low spot. Something else we did here when we prepared this site for planting is we tilled in some compost. Now, you can spend an hour or more talking about the different types of composts and the, and the merits. Uh, but in this case, in our sandy soil, the benefit of applying compost was it increased the water holding capacity. Which sounds counterintuitive, we just said this soil is in a low spot. But, during the summer months, especially when it doesn't rain, we want our soil to hold some water for the plants. So compost can have an advantage in clay soils and sandy soils, and it kind of has an opposite effect. In sandy soils, organic matter, compost, or other types of organic matter, will actually increase the water holding capacity of the soil. And nutrient holding capacity. And nutrient holding capacity. Very important. Sandy soils are nutrient poor in general and don't hold nutrients as well. But in the clay soil situation, organic matter will actually increase the internal drainage. So it helps create poor spaces and better soil structure so that the water can actually flow through. So I'm a big fan of compost when it's used correctly. And speaking of being used correctly and just uh, soil preparation, site preparation in general, uh, you notice Dr. Shiner mentioned that he tilled in this compost. What we do not want to do is we do not want to dig the hole for the tree and fill it as we plant the tree, fill it with compost or potting soil. What we want to do is we want to plant the tree in the soil and ultimately in the soil that it's going to be growing in. So if we want to, that's great if we want to mix in and incorporate some organic material into the soil, but we want to do it on a large scale. So what we don't want is a very big change where where the, the, where the tree is planted is just basically potting soil or compost and then all of a sudden it hits the native soil and that's where we have problems, is where we have these big changes in soil texture. So what I did in order to avoid breaking the bank with compost, because I've got about 100 fruit trees here, is I went to our local landfill and they had compost available in bulk. And it was relatively inexpensive. So if you're gonna plant on a large scale, you may consider buying compost in bulk rather than in individual bags. And so la the year before I planted, I came in, I killed the weeds in the area that I wanted to plant these fruit trees. I put the compost on the surface a few inches deep and then I tilled it in thoroughly. And so each one of these fruit trees uh, received an area of, of, of compost of about four foot by four foot. Uh, so a four foot section by four foot section and tilled it in rather than the entire length of this row uh, just due to cost. So what you can see here is that we have mulched all of these fruit trees. So what do you think about using mulch when it comes to fruit trees or maybe even ornamental plants? I'm a big fan of mulch. There are a lot of benefits associated with mulch. Uh, of course, we do have to do mulch correctly. We'll talk just briefly about that. Uh, mulch, especially when we mention mulch, we're particularly talking about organic type mulches. Now, when I say organic, I'm talking about a material that's derived from something that was once alive. In this case, we've got uh, this this material that is hardwood mulch, and so of course it's uh, derived from wood that was shredded, primarily hardwood, some bark in there too. And so what that is gonna do is several different things. As you can see here, um, it's really gonna help prevent, prevent weeds. Uh, the other thing it's gonna do is it's gonna really reduce moisture loss. So it's gonna be a physical barrier to evaporation and it's also going to shield that soil from from the uh, sunlight and so it's going to keep that soil much much cooler some other benefits and this is where i really get excited uh, we talked about compost this is going to continue to act like a compost on top and so as that mulch de as that mulch decomposes as it breaks down it's going to release humic acids it's going to release organic matter and it's going to continue to replenish that soil and you'll actually studies have shown you'll actually get some nutrients even nitrogen supplied by the mulch as well i'll tell you why i put nitrogen the primary reason is because i'm lazy and controlling weeds around fruit trees or in your garden can be an absolute headache and so applying mulch uh, especially hardwood three inches or more deep really helps with weed control 
and it reduces my need to water because here in College Station, our city water is not good. All right, so you've ordered your fruit trees, or maybe you just went and picked them up at the nursery. You're excited, you're getting ready to plant. There's a couple of things you need to think about when you plant these trees to get them started correctly. So, Tim, tell us how to plant a containerized. All righty, so one of the first things we've got to keep in mind when we're talking about fruit trees is that fruit trees are often grafted or budded. Dr. Stein talked about this earlier this spring when he talked about grafting pots. So most of our fruit trees, when they're grafted or budded, they're gonna have two different parts. We have the rootstock, which is gonna serve as the root system, as the name implies, of the tree. It serves as the workforce of the tree as well. And so it can offer adaptations, for example, such as uh, giving us tolerance to alkaline soil, uh, in some crops, we may have improved tolerance to alkalinity, uh, maybe disease resistance, for example, like nemagard and peach gives us uh, resistance to nematodes. In, in apples, there are also dwarfing rootstocks. And some of these can result in very, very small trees that actually have to be trellis grown on wires because the root system uh, does not anchor very, very well. In Texas, we generally do not recommend using these, these dwarf rootstocks. Uh, we typically are recommend using either a standard rootstock or something like M7, M111. It's going to give you uh, close to a full-size tree. So here you can see, this is this would be our bud union, and you can see where the rootstock stops, and you can see where the scion starts. The scion, S-C-I-O-N, of course, is our improved variety. This is what's actually going to produce our flowers and fruits. So one thing is just to keep in mind where this un this graft or bud union is at whenever we plant. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this tree ready. And so I'm going to invert the pot, take the pot off, and you can see the root system. Now, this particular tree does not have a really well-developed root system, so I have to be very careful as I handle it. If you do see oftentimes, if, if you've got a tree that maybe is, has a large top, it's been in the pot for a long time, you'll see uh, a lot of a lot of thick, coarse roots that are circling. And if these roots are circling, uh, we wanna go and do some root pruning because what's gonna happen is the roots are just gonna continue to grow in a circle. Now, some may grow out, but uh, what we don't want is these roots to continue to grow in a circle and eventually uh, this could result in, in the tree's root system kind of strangling itself. So if we did have a tree that had a really thick circling root system, what we would do, we could take a knife, we could take printing shears, and make vertical cuts to cut through, sever those roots on two or three sides, and that's just gonna help to encourage the roots to grow outward. Alrighty, so with this tree, it's being containerized or, or, or grown in a pot. It's really easy to see the original soil level. Um, now, if you were doing, of course, the bare root tree, usually there's a cut, there's uh, the original soil line is kind of indicated by a color change, usually you can see. But when we plant this tree, we wanna make sure that we plant it at about the same height as originally. We do not want to plant this tree uh, substantially deeper than it originally was. And, we, and okay. we certainly do not want to plant this plant this tree to where the graft union or the bud union is actually buried. So that, that's a big no-no. So generally we want to plant these the same height that they originally were growing. <laughs> really critical to start training your tree properly during the first year. The, ultimately, the shape and the success of the tree is dictated by what you do during the first year. So we're looking here at a very vigorous and healthy apple tree that was planted this year. Uh, you notice it's got a grow tube or a trunk protector, tr a trunk guard on it, and that's just going to help protect it from sun's call, from herbicides, from herbivores. And you can see this tree is already, it's got a, a nice strong leader. We typically are going to grow apples is a central leader, which basically imagine a Christmas tree shape where we've got a, a single leader that's going vertically and then we've got our scaffolds coming off of that, or as a modified central leader. And you can see we've got a nice strong leader, but we've also got some pretty well positioned scaffold limbs that are already, uh, that are pretty well placed that we can, we can select uh, already in the winter time. All right, so let's talk about pruning and training here with a tree that's a little bit older. So we've seen a one-year-old tree or a newly planted tree. Now we have a two-year-old tree and we can see some of those same pruning practices here. This is a modified central leader system. 
that central leader, that central trunk is pretty easy to see on this tree. We also have these horizontal branches here that we call scaffold limbs. So when it comes to retaining limbs on a fruit tree, especially apples in our case, there's some things that you can look for. And so Tim, if you were going to prune this tree, you know, what are some, what are some features that you would automatically see uh, as beneficial or ones that you may want to get rid of? So generally uh, on most fruit trees, really especially palm fruits, uh, apple trees like this, we want to make sure that we do a good job of selecting, judiciously selecting uh, the limbs that we're going to keep. We want them to be nice strong ones. We want them to be spaced out. And this is kind of in an ideal situation. It's not, it doesn't always work out this way, but typically on apples, we want uh, for every, every tier, every level, we want about three scaffold limbs that are going out that are spaced out about 120 degrees. Again, it doesn't always work that way. And what we would do is as the tree grows, we would select another level of scaffolds up here. And so we do this, we spread these scaffolds out so that they can get sufficient sunlight. We don't want a big thick bush. We also want uh, air movement to come in and dry out those leaves and reduce the amount of uh, problems we have with disease. But what we're looking for here is we want limbs that they are gonna be growing out kind of horizontally, as, as uh, Justin said. We don't want really vertical limbs. Vertical limbs, uh, what they're gonna do is they're gonna, they're gonna tend to be vegetative. They're gonna be very vigorous. And as you see here, like this one, it's gonna wanna grow straight up and it's not really gonna wanna produce flowers and fruit. Uh, sometimes with some varieties, there's a lot of difference in tree architecture depending on the variety. That's all they want to do. They just want to grow straight up. So uh, I think there's, there's something we could do about that when we're training. Yeah. So just to recap quickly, he's pointing out these angles right here. He was talking about the crotch angle and you want it as close to 90 degrees as you can get it. 90 degrees would be great. That's going to be the strongest. And you really want to avoid really narrow crotch angles because those are going to have a tendency to break uh, and they're more likely to collect diseases and things like that. So if we have some nice good lateral scaffold limbs, then we're in good shape. But as he said, sometimes they want to grow very vertical and that's especially true when we're in warm climates like this and the fruit has a higher chilling requirement. We haven't talked about chilling yet, but now's a good time to do it. So Tim, you've done some research on chilling in kiwi fruit. Can you give us a quick and dirty definition of winter chilling as it relates to fruit trees? So as a temperate fruit crop, something that, that uh, originated in, in a temperate zone, these fruit trees have a certain amount of chilling, and these are temperatures generally below 45 or between 32 and 45 degrees Fahrenheit that the tree has to be exposed to. And this, this is required for uh, the tree to, uh, to receive adequate rest, but it's also very important to allow the tree to be able to resume growth properly in the spring and ultimately produce adequate flowers and fruit. And, it, and this really depends uh, by, by crop, depends upon the crop and variety. For example, there are peach varieties that require 150 hours where others require over 1,000 hours. Okay, so we can find this information online. We can look up, you know, apple varieties, peach varieties. You can get a general idea of what their chilling requirement is, but how do we find out what the chilling is in a particular area? So if you say here in College Station, how do we get that information? That's a good question because uh, our average chilling in College Station is anywhere from 550, 6, 650 hours, but that's an average. And of course, when we're dealing with weather, averages really don't mean a whole lot. We can go anywhere from 300 to 1,000 hours or units of chilling from year to year. And so there are, fortunately, there are websites out there like Get Chill. This is one word, getchill.net. Um, there's another good one, uh, Mississippi State. They're chilling, you can just Google Mississippi State chilling and you can type in your, your uh, zip code or your local weather station and select the dates. Typically, we're talking about uh, beginning of November to the end of February and it will actually tell you how much chilling estimated chilling you've received. Okay, so we know here in College Station you said four to seven hundred hours roughly. So a pretty wide range, that's almost a two-fold range. If I'm picking a peach tree or an apple tree, what number do I use? 
So typically what we recommend is, again, with this average really, vary, this amount really varying from year to year, is you typically want to go, you want to kind of hedge your bet a little bit. So you may select a variety that, that will, uh, a variety that requires about 150 hours less than your average or 150 hours more than your average, okay? And if you do that, generally, uh, chilling requirements are, are a bit flexible to some degree, and so usually you're gonna be okay most years if you do that. Um, however, if you really wanna get out there and, and, and really kinda live on the edge, you could select some higher chill varieties and some lower chill varieties that, that vary substantially from that average. Just keep in mind that if you select a variety that has too high of a chilling requirement, you're not going to get adequate flowers and fruit in most years. You're also not going to get good vegetative bud break. And ultimately, over, over many years, you can actually result, uh, you can have trees that, that end up dying eventually because they don't get the proper amount of rest uh, over many years. Uh, now, of course, we have the opposite problem with varieties that have too low of a chilling requirement. They come out and bloom too early. They get hit by a, uh, a freeze and you lose your crop and you can also sometimes get some severe freeze injury to the tree itself. Okay, so this variety of apple right here is called Virginia Beauty. And I don't know what the chilling requirement is specifically of Virginia Beauty, uh, but I can tell you the chilling is, hasn't been met in the past few years. And the reason I know is the way it breaks bud very, very late, like you're talking about. Uh, it's very vertical and vegetative. We can see we don't have those nice horizontal branches coming off of this central leader. Uh, but in the case for apples, it doesn't appear to be quite as detrimental as some trees like peaches. And so there are some cases where apples are grown in some pretty hot climates with relatively low chilling. Now I say that because apples, many varieties have a very high chilling requirement. Now there are some varieties like Anna that only require a few hundred or several hundred hours uh, but then there are varieties that might require 2,000 hours. Now I'm not saying ignore chilling by any means, uh, but you really have to try to pick something that is pretty close to the chill in your area uh, to make things uh, as easy as possible. And so in this case, we did not receive proper chilling. We had a very late delay in bud break and bud break was right here towards the tips of the shoots. Now in apples, what's kind of interesting is you can stimulate bud break to some degree by tipping those shoots. So I'll come in here either in late winter or early spring and I'll tip those shoots and typically what we see is bud break immediately below those cuts. Commercially or in hot climates, sometimes they'll actually come in and make uh, horizontal cuts above the buds that they want to break. And so that's a lot of extra effort that a lot of people don't want to take on. Now let's talk about how to get a tree like this into fruit production. So you can see this tree is very vertical. And so over time, it will eventually produce fruit. That fruit will pull down on these branches and will actually start to open that tree up. You'll see the same thing in pairs, but you can kind of trick them into doing that a little bit earlier. All right, so what Justin was talking about doing was getting some of these these uh, scaffold limbs positioned more horizontally or, or at less of a vertical angle, okay? And what that's gonna do is several things. Physiologically, that's gonna make these limbs act more or behave more like they're older. And so what you get, as you see here, is you actually start getting, uh, and this is really important in some of the spur fruiting varieties, but you start getting these spurs, okay? Apples, pears, some other fruits, um, produce these spurs. And what a spur is, it's just a very short, compressed uh, branch, essentially. And they tend to they tend to produce a lot of flowers and our spur fruiting apples, this is where the majority of our apples and fruit are gonna come from. And so you can see here how this limb, as it's more at kind of a 50 degree or so angle, you're getting these spurs that are actually forming. Whereas if we didn't do anything, like this vertical one, it may take years before we get some spurs and ultimately fruit on this limb. Now you'll notice this little, I don't know what you call it, this little stretchy plastic uh, string material has been used. It's been staked to the, to the ground. And what it's doing is it's actually physically pulling, holding down this limb. Now there are other ways you could do this. Uh, some people elect to go and uh, tie weights, hang weights on here. 
There are also um, spreaders, limb spreaders. Some of them you can actually buy. And basically what it is, it's a piece of wood or plastic. It's gonna, it's gonna have little notches that go between the main, the main trunk, the main leader, and the, and the scaffold, and it's just gonna space it out. Now, we were talking earlier, and you gotta be really careful. We don't want a vertical limb, but at the same time, if you go too far, if you make this thing 90 degrees, even though that would be the strongest limb, what you end up with is a lot of what we call water sprouts, okay? So what happens is the end of this limb is no longer in charge, and so it allows all of these other shoots to kind of take over, and these things can be very vigorous and basically turn into the vertical shoots that you were trying to uh, eliminate and avoid to begin with. So we kind of like to be somewhere in this range, this kind of 45, maybe up to 60 degree angle. And again, we can do this by tying them down, by weighting them down, or, or with a limb type, a limb spacer. All right, so we have a variety here called Reverend Morgan. This variety actually hails from Texas. It was a seedling of Granny Smith uh, in the 1960s. And so I planted it here just to see how it would do in College Station. As you can see, it's very vertical. Uh, we did not come in and spread those limbs or tie those limbs down enough on this tree, and so it's maintained this very vertical shape. Likewise, when we made a, a head cut, so when we cut it back when it was young, we had some of these lateral branches. We also maintained some lower branches. So we have multiple leaders right here. And so the problem with that is these two trunks right here are rubbing together. So that's gonna create problems uh, for things like trunk disease. So that could be an entry point. And so some, sometime during the dormant season, we'll come in and cut that off. So likewise, we see a lot of those blind nodes or those empty spaces along the branches. I do believe this was because this tree did not receive adequate chilling because it had a very delayed bud break and it had a expanded bloom period or a protracted bloom period and you can actually see that in the fruit so on this tree we have some very small apples right here we'll take a look at those and then we have some very we have some larger apples and even a, a full-size apple all on the same tree. So basically the tree gets confused. It doesn't, it's kind of like uh, you, if you don't get a good night's sleep, you wake up, you're kind of foggy, you're confused, you're, uh, you just don't feel good. And so the tree's kind of confused. It puts off some flowers here and there and then later on, and it's just real sporadic and just really random. So for me as a backyard grower, that's perfectly fine because uh, I don't want all my apples ripe at once. But if you were trying to do this commercially, that would be an absolute deal breaker and that's one reason why we don't see commercial many commercial apple orchards especially in the southern part of the state next commercially what you would do is you would actually go in and you would thin these these thin your crop and it's really difficult to do especially if you're using a chemical thinning agent and you've got bloom that spread out for weeks or even even months so in this scenario we're less likely to need to thin but a lot of times what we'll see is apples born in little clusters and so you can thin those by hand just by pinching off those young apples after they start to develop. Right. So now we're gonna talk about, remember we mentioned that, uh, that we're limited in apple production by a lot of the disease and pest problems we have here in Texas, especially in the southern part of the state where it's really humid. And one of those problems is fire blight. Fire blight is a bacterial infection. It uh, plagues apples, especially pears and other pome fruits. So we have, an example, this isn't a really severe one, but uh, you can see what happens basically. The bacteria enters typically through the flowers. It can also enter through uh, their pruning wounds, uh, through other types of, of physical wounds typically, and it causes rapid uh, tissue damage. And so generally what we look for is we see this just rapid, uh, basically overnight uh, death of the leaves on a, on a particular shoot. Um, and oftentimes it'll, it'll kind of make this this crook at the end called a shepherd's hook, shepherd's crook, okay? And so uh, there are ways, chemical ways to, uh, chemical products that can help prevent this, but if you see it, you gotta basically nip it in the bud, okay? So physical removal is what we're looking for. 
So anytime you see this, you want to make sure you have sterilized pruning equipment. Cut it off to fresh, healthy tissue. And uh, okay. Now this was a spur. Of course, it's by nature very short. Uh, but if this occurred on, on a longer shoot, uh, we would actually want to cut even farther back. We want to make sure that what we're doing, we want to make sure that we're cutting back to only healthy tissue. So we're basically amputating that shoot and removing anything that might be uh, that might be infected with that with that bacteria. And again, we want to make sure that we're sterilizing uh, our, our printing equipment in between. Right. And generally speaking, fire blight it, it varies a lot depending on variety, but generally apples are not nearly susceptible in Texas to fire blight as pears are. Okay, some, so some other major diseases. Uh, powdery mildew is primarily an issue in the spring. We have cool temperatures. Uh, there are also cedar apple rust or juniper quince rust, which is a really a, an interesting and complicated disease. Uh, it causes defoliation. Uh, it's primarily an issue uh, whenever we have uh, junipers in the nearby area, which serve as an alternate host. Uh, we can also get canker diseases, especially fungal canker, bacterial canker, which end up causing these lesions and rotting of the major limbs and even in the trunk sometimes. Talk about apples and diseases. One disease we cannot neglect to mention is cotton root rot. Cotton root rot is a fungal disease. It's uh, endemic, it's native to soils in a lot of Texas where we have an alkaline soil, a pH above seven, and it affects many different, different species. Uh, unfortunately, there's not much we can really do about it. And so when it does strike, it's, it appears to strike very quickly. The trees appear to just go down almost overnight and so it is something to keep in mind and the reason we mention it with apples is because there was actually an attempt uh, many decades ago to establish in the hill country establish a large commercial apple industry that ultimately failed because of this disease all right so we've talked about some of the diseases of the foliage and the wood itself now we're going to talk about some of the diseases of the fruit and so just to generalize and simplify things the further east you live in Texas, the higher the rainfall, the more humidity you have, the greater risk you're gonna have of these diseases. So what do you do about it? One is you select varieties, if you can, that have disease resistance. And then two, you may have to get out and apply some protectant sprays. So when it comes to fruit diseases, one of the most common diseases is bitter rot. So bitter rot starts off typically as a small brown speck on your fruit that grows in size, and then eventually it becomes sunken in and the fruit will rot and often drop prematurely from the tree. So there are no varieties that I'm aware of that are resistant to bitter rot. Um, and it's gonna be worse in years that are more wet. So you just have to deal with this disease and discard some of the fruit or cut around it when you eat the fruit or apply some sort of protective measure. There are also a few physiological disorders of the fruit. So in this case, we're looking at bitter pit you can see these slightly discolored sunken areas on the outside skin of the fruit. And it often you'll see that in the bottom part of the fruit. And when you cut into it, you'll see these dried brown areas. And so that just affects fruit quality. The fruit is still palatable, uh, but you often have to discard those areas that are heavily affected or fruit that are heavily affected. There's another common condition called water core uh, and one other called lentisol blotch. Okay, so earlier when we talked about planting, we talked a little bit about these trunk protectors. And there's a couple of reasons why you wanna do that. One is it protects the, the shoots, the growth down inside the tube from rabbits or deer or other browsing animals. Uh, in apples, it also helps protect against sun scald. So apples are particularly sensitive to sun scald, especially in a hot climate like we have here in Texas. And so in this tree, it was not protected early on and you can see where the trunk was damaged. This is on the western side of this tree, in that afternoon sun that's really hot and intense. And what it did is it damaged the wood right here, and it has now died, and it is trying to grow back over and close that wound. So how do we prevent that from happening? Well, you can add a trunk protector like this, or some people will actually paint the trucks, the trunks, they will use something like a white or light colored latex paint, dilute it by 50%, and then they'll paint those trunks uh, or any other well exposed areas, especially on that west side. All right, so we've talked about how to grow apple trees successfully. 
but we haven't talked about one of the, if not the most important decision you can make when it comes to growing fruit, and that's selecting the right variety. So what do we need to look at? So yeah, one of the first things we want to look at is chilling. Remember we talked about the importance of chilling, and we want to make sure that the varieties that we do select are appropriately adapted to your average chilling. So when you go to Aggie Horticulture and you look at these fruit publications, you'll see that they have a map of the, uh, <clears throat> the relative or the am average amount of chilling you can expect in your area, your general area. And you wanna make sure that you, you uh, select your varieties based on that, based on the, the average amount of chilling that you're gonna receive. That's, that's one of the first critical uh, parameters. Let me tell you what I did for my home orchard here is I definitely looked at chilling. Um, that wasn't the overriding decision. What really was was disease resistance. And so we don't have an abundance of information or data from Texas to tell you exactly which apples to grow. But I went on the internet and I went to different university websites and collected as much information as I could about different varieties. And I selected those that had the best disease resistance, but were still described as having good eating properties. All right, so if you want more information about apple varieties that may be suited to your area, check out our website, aggiehorticulture.tamu.edu. And we have fact sheets on different types of fruit, including apples. And in there, you're gonna find information about how to select varieties that have done well in Texas. And what I'll say is don't be afraid to experiment when it comes to apples or really any other fruit, but you can save yourself a lot of time, a lot of sweat, and a lot of money by doing your homework before you plant. Mm -hmm.